Macar is an amazing organization, really providing support for individuals with disabilities. Our motto has always been, no child left behind. And this is an organization that helps everybody. We never say no to anybody. We could take care of you from when you're born throughout. And now you watch what this organization has turned into. Over 30 group homes, 40 different locations, 850 staff providing over 1,000 services to the community at large. I don't think they ever envision this organization turning into what it is. They work with heart, they're caring, they're devoted, and they go the extra mile. They, they should help every single person under their care. They're phenomenal. They just know my daughter. They know Hadass like she was theirs. They, they just know what Hadass needs at all hours of the day and night. They have an involved medical team with nurses and physicians and specialty doctors who help care for their patients um, for all facets of their medical care. They're irreplaceable. They just give that personal attention where everyone is special in the eyes of the counselors. I just see a smile on those kids' faces, and that is what keeps me going. how nice that they're doing, how much progress they're making. It just makes every single day amazing. The kids come running and very excited to go you know, do their program, go to the gym. They like switching from activity to activity and you just feel the warmth and love in the classroom. Our individuals have such quality of life. They are constantly going out on trips. They are having entertainment in the homes. I have to sometimes make appointments to see the children because they are too busy to see me. It's been an amazing experience for me working for Makar. The feeling that you get working here is like nothing you've ever felt before. The boys became my children. The feeling that I can improve the quality of life, there's no feeling like that in the world. The children would have very, very severe, difficult diagnosis and prognosis. They wouldn't live very long. However, when the children came to us, they did not read their medical reports. They did not know their prognosis, and they lived, and they thrived, and they grew, and they developed. We really work as a group. We feed off of each other. We have new admissions all the time. We try to do the most research, find the best doctors for our individuals. To make them feel safe and comfortable, to take care of them, whether it's housing, whether it's helping them with a job, helping them take care of their medical needs, their physical needs. They're not in it alone. I love the poor. I love the poor. We are the happiest home. This is a real home with love and, and warmth and, and everybody knows everybody. It's a family. Attention, love, care, they blend all of those factors into it, and they really turn it into a family atmosphere. They went the extra mile. I will always be indebted to them. They took a person that nobody was able to help. They made a functional human being out of her. It's not like a child, a baby, and it starts developing, and then you send them to school, and then they get married. This is a child that's yours forever. But as services are needed differently than they've ever been needed before, it takes a lot of innovation, it takes a lot of amazing staff, and it takes an investment in there. If you're lucky enough not to have a child with disabilities, then you must know somebody who has a child with disabilities. This hits everybody. I implore anybody at any time to visit a home, and they will see the love and the staff and the dedication. Uh, uh, good evening. I am Dr. Pinchas Lerner, uh, Makar's uh, clinical uh, director. Thank you for listening in. Uh, this evening we're going to be focusing on a very practical um, um, subject. Should I give psychotropic uh, medication to my child to improve his or her uh, behavior? 
We will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. It is likely that many parents of children with special needs will confront the question of psychotropic medication at some point in their child's life. When I use the word child, I am also referring to adult children of any age. And uh, by the way, a lot of things that we're going to be saying equally apply to, uh, to a neurotypical children and adults. By psychotropic uh, medication, I mean any uh, medication whose purpose is to modify feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. It could be a medication that is primarily used as a psychiatric drug. For example, Seroquel, uh, Ritalin, Zoloft. Alternatively, it could be a medication that is primarily used for non-psychiatric purposes, such as Tegretol for seizures, Indorol for uh, blood pressure, or, uh, or a Benadryl for allergic uh, reactions. These medications, among many others, are also used as psychotropics. There are a number of typical scenarios in which the question of psychotropics is raised. Sometimes the question flows from the parent's concern about the child's behavior at home. The child's behavior may be difficult to manage. For example, the child may be non-compliant, uh, irritable, uh, 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 aggressive, or the child may be uh, withdrawn and does not participate in activities. Sleeper eating patterns may be uh, disturbed. The child does not seem happy. At other times, the concern about the child's behavior is raised by others outside the home, by the school, the residence, the day program, the camp. In any event, the suggestion of the possibility of psychotropics to address the concerning uh, behaviors is often met by a mixture of strong feelings. On the one hand, as a parent, I want to do everything I can to make my child happier and more uh, uh, productive. Medication may be a relatively quick solution to improve my child's quality of life. On the other hand, I'm afraid that psychotropics will change my child's personality uh, negatively and make him or her into something other than the beautiful child God gave me. Also, I don't want to change my child for my own convenience. It's true that my life would be a lot better if he could sit still, if she didn't tear my house to pieces, if he would participate in sports. But isn't it selfish to give my child medication for my convenience? Also, should I risk the side effects that may come along with psychotropics? Will I actually be doing my child more harm than good by trying psychotropics? Before suggesting an approach to the question of giving uh, medication to our children with developmental challenges, I'd like to mention a few points. There are currently no medications that can raise global uh, intelligence or overcome learning uh, difficulties. However, psychotropic uh, medications may in some cases increase calm 
and focus and make it possible to learn better. Similarly, despite advertisements in the popular press, there are at this point no substances that can cure the core symptoms of autistic spectrum uh, disorder, namely social and communication challenges and uh, perseverative repetitive behavior. Again, psychotropic medication along with behavioral and environmental approaches can perhaps be helpful in addressing the secondary symptoms often associated with autistic spectrum disorder, such as the anxiety, the agitation, and the depression that often comes along with it. We do have faith in God that therapies will be developed that will cure the core features of developmental challenges, but we are not there yet. Let us then suggest a child-centered approach to the question of using medication to change behavior. I'd like to propose 10 principles to guide this approach. First, the purpose of medication is to enhance the quality of life of the child, to improve his or her functioning and well-being, and to lessen the child's pain and discomfort. Medication should never be used solely for the benefit of the caretakers of the child. Secondly, uh, medication may have a helpful role in some cases of mood and behavioral challenges because frequently chemical imbalances contribute to these challenges. Just as diabetes is characterized by a chemical imbalance associated with insulin, uh, glucose, and is treated with medications that adjust this imbalance. Similarly, many mood and behavioral issues are mediated by chemicals known as neurotransmitters. Uh, norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, and GABA are examples of neurotransmitters. For example, depression may result when there is a serotonin imbalance. Uh, medications such as Prozac, Lexapro, Zoloft may be helpful in correcting this imbalance. Treating the neurotransmitter imbalance that may be contributing to challenging moods and behaviors may lead to significant improvements in the child's quality of life. Third, medication should be considered only when the individual's behavior interferes in a major way with his or her well-being or functioning. A behavior or mood state that occurs only from time to time or is relatively mild in nature is usually not a candidate for medication. Occasional aches and pains, anxiety, uh, depression are a part of life rather than indications of illness. Fourth, before assuming that we are dealing with a psychiatric issue, physical factors may be precipitating the challenging behaviors or mood states must be ruled out first. Is the child physically ill or in pain? ear infections, 
urinary tract infections, strep throat, or dental issues, for example, are common reasons for an individual to become uh, irritable or anxious. A visit to the pediatrician or internist and blood and urine testing is crucial, especially if there is a sudden change in behavior or mood. Is the child or adult getting enough sleep? This question is not considered often enough. Has there been a change in diet? Is your child hungry, too hot, too cold, or in some way physically uncomfortable? These factors must be ruled out before considering psychotropic treatment. Let me tell you Joey's story. Joey's behavior suddenly began to change. He became angry, agitated, aggressive, non-compliant. Joey, which is not his real name, is verbal and can generally express his feelings. He was not able, however, to identify what was bothering him. The staff at his group home, who know him well, uh, uh, were baffled. He looked healthy. Staff took him to his physician, who said he was fine. He was treated for strep. Uh, he was, uh, uh, he was uh, tested for strep throat, uh, urinary tract infection, and did not have either. The staff was about to refer him for psychiatric consultation when one of the staff suggested that we take Joey to the dentist to rule out dental discomfort. Sure enough, the dentist discovered the major abscess in the back of Joey's mouth that was causing all the discomfort and the sudden change in behavior. The abscess was causing diffuse pain and discomfort so that Joey was not able to localize his pain to that specific area. Joey was treated uh, with antibiotics. His behavior soon improved uh, dramatically and return to his typical baseline. Since we are focusing on the physical concomitants of behavior and mood, let's talk a little about sleep. Most of our 24-hour day is spent in sleep, yet we tend to under-focus on it when we discuss mood or behavior. Insufficient and poor quality sleep is a major factor in disturbances of mood and behavior. We all know that when we don't sleep well, we do not think, feel, or act well. Sleep disturbance can result from many factors. The individual may have a primary impairment of the sleep process, such as evident in, in uh, a sleep apnea. Physical illness or pain may disturb sleep. Environmental factors, such as noise, uh, roommate behavior, may lead to poor sleep. Very often, engaging in behavior that contradicts sleep, or what's known as poor Sleep hygiene is what is leading to a poor night's sleep. For example, talking on the phone or watching TV while in bed is likely to make it more difficult to fall asleep. Similarly, engaging in strenuous exercise or eating a heavy meal right before bedtime 
is apt to interfere with sleep. In any event, sleep must be seriously investigated as an important player in mood and, uh, and behavior, and steps need to be taken to improve the quality of sleep. Fifth, aside from physical precipitants of challenging behaviors or, or uh, mood states, environmental stressors must be ruled out as well. This is especially so since some individuals with special needs, especially those on the autistic spectrum, are especially sensitive to changes in the environment. Common examples are changes in schedule, new roommate, new teacher, change in the behavior of peers or siblings. The need for good detective work to investigate whether your child is reacting to environmental changes is especially crucial when the child's capacity for self-report is limited. Of course, in the presence of environmental stressors, environmental change should be tried before considering a psychotropic uh, a, a medication. Let me tell you another story. Sally is nonverbal, but generally uh, quite happy, uh, quite cooperative. She recently started to become uh, quite irritable and sulky twice a week. These difficult moods would last for hours. She would withdraw to her room, refuse to eat or perform basic self-help tasks. She was checked out medically. Uh, she was healthy. Staff sat down together to brainstorm about whether anything was taking place in the environment during those specific times that might lead to Sally's being uncomfortable. A new apartment mate had recently moved in. Sally liked her very much, and they became friends. Sally's new friends received a visit from her parents twice a week. Staff took a written data and concluded that the irritability uh, withdrawal that Sally was demonstrating typically coincided with the visits of her friend's parents. Sally's parents uh, lived far away and she rarely saw them. Staff hypothesized that her friend's uh, parental uh, visits were the antecedents for Sally's uh, behavioral challenges. They devised two interventions and took data on the frequency and timing of Sally's uh, difficult times. Sally uh, would take Sally, uh, uh, staff uh, would take uh, Sally out for a one-to-one -one trip when her friend's parents uh, visited. They also encouraged Sally's parents to have more contact with her through remote means such as uh, uh, through FaceTime. These interventions dramatically uh, reduced the frequency of Sally's challenging uh, behaviors without the need to consider psychotropic medication. Six, generally before medication is considered, non-medication treatments should be considered first and seriously tried. These include counseling, behavioral therapies, 
uh, physical exercise, uh, relaxation exercises, and increase and fun and positive activities. Each of these approaches uh, requires further discussion, which is not in the purview of our um, discussion tonight. I would, however, like to dwell for a moment on behavioral approaches, since these are often highly effective in increasing uh, desirable uh, behaviors and decreasing undesirable ones. Parents and caretakers often say that they have tried uh, behavioral techniques and that they have not worked. However, they frequently have not implemented these approaches correctly or consistently. For example, parents and caretakers may give the reinforcement before rather than after the child demonstrates the desired behavior. If you promise not to hit Johnny, I'll give you a dollar now, is an example of a bribe rather than a reinforcement. Generally, carrying out even the simplest behavior modification program requires training so that it is done correctly and consistently. Seventh, psychotropic uh, medication should only be given if the problem behavior is one that is likely to respond to medication. There are some behaviors or psychiatric symptoms that are very challenging, but that do not respond well to psychotropics. An example would be uh, uh, kleptomania, which is the compulsive tendency to take objects from other people. Uh, many studies have shown that there is no psychotropic uh, medication that is consistently helpful for kleptomania. Uh, eighth, psychotropic uh, medication should be prescribed by psychiatrists who are expert diagnosticians and expert psychopharmacologists with experience and knowledge in the issues that they are treating. In fact, most psychotropics are prescribed by, uh, by uh, pediatricians, internists, and other physicians without specific expertise in the diagnosis and treatment of psychiatric and behavioral conditions. Ninth, and this is an important uh, bottom line, many scientific studies and a great deal of clinical experience uh, indicates that psychotropic medication, if prescribed judiciously by an expert psychiatrist, can successfully treat a, a, a variety of psychiatric and behavioral conditions. Psychotropics, along with non-medication techniques, can in fact often make a significant uh, positive difference in the quality of life of individuals suffering from a variety of challenges. When confronting behaviors and mood states that are particularly difficult for your child, psychotropic medication represents an important option that at least should be given consideration. Tenth, the process of finding the right medication at the right dose 
uh, uh, with minimal or no side effects can be frustrating and time consuming. It does sometimes happen that the miracle drug with great efficacy and no side effects is found on the first try. But often the road is rocky with multiple attempts with different drugs at different uh, dosages. Side effects may need to be addressed. Throughout the whole process of psychotropic treatment, we need to keep in the back of our mind the cost-benefit uh, ratio. Is there enough of an improvement in the quality of my child's life to warrant actual side effects or the chance of side effects from this particular drug at this particular dose? Let's talk some more about side effects. These psychotropic medications uh, have side effects. They sure do. Do antibiotics have side effects? They sure do. Do medications that address cardiac, uh, GI, uh, pulmonary, and any other uh, medical issues have side effects? They sure do. But historically, psychotropics have gotten fairly bad press uh, regarding the side effects that they cause. This is partially connected to old films that depict uh, the experiments done on poor patients causing a gruesome side effects and turning these individuals into, into uh, zombies. Uh, zombies is in fact the most common word used when parents discuss the risk of putting their child on to psychotropics. But history to the, to the side, and as with all medications, side effects do need to be seriously uh, considered. Such consideration is complicated by the fact that it is difficult to predict which individuals will develop side effects. And if they do, what type of side effects they will get. Thank God, and is, and is with most medications, side effects of psychotropics are typically uh, temporarily and fairly uh, mild. But this is not always the case. And therefore, due diligence must be exercised to lessen the risk of side effects as much as possible. A few strategies that psychiatrists use to reduce the burden of side effects are the following. If possible, uh, medications are begun at low dosages to give the individual the chance to adjust to them. If possible, psychotropics are uh, titrated uh, slowly to a therapeutic dose, which also uh, reduces the risk of significant side effects. Uh, moreover, the psychiatrist takes a careful uh, medical history of the individual and his or her family to determine what side effects to be particularly concerned about. Uh, uh, medications can then be chosen that are less likely to produce these side effects that might be uh, continually concerning for that person. For example, an individual with uh, a, a diabetic condition can be given a psychotropic that will be less likely to, in, to interfere with 
uh, the metabolism of glucose. An individual with gait instability can be given uh, medications that are less likely to produce uh, sedation. Generally, throughout the whole process of psychiatric treatment, two questions need to be asked. Is my child significantly uh, improving with regard to those behaviors that are being treated? And what are the side effects? The bottom line question, as we previously mentioned, is, is there enough of an improvement in the quality of my child's life to warrant actual side effects or the chance of side effects from this particular drug at this particular dose? Another topic I'd like uh, to discuss that is crucial to your child's getting the best possible psychiatric care is communication. It is said that getting through life successfully is a function of three things. Uh, communication, communication, communication. Such is it in the process of educating your child's uh, psychiatrist in what he or she needs to know in order to determine what, psych uh, what psychotropic to try, uh, if any, uh, with your child. It is unfortunately quite common for parents or staff to send a developmentally a challenged person to a psychiatrist with a chaperone who knows very little about the individual or cannot communicate well with the psychiatrist. A, a, a detailed report provided by a parent or staff who knows the individual uh, well, is in fact the data that the psychiatrist uh, relies on for a good diagnosis and good uh, treatment. The psychiatrist is not a prophet who can lay hands upon your child and come to reliable conclusions about uh, what his or what her needs are. The few minutes spent uh, with the child uh, are important for uh, uh, the psychiatrist. Uh, 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 the psychiatrist does need to see uh, your child, but this small slice in time is not sufficient to inform the psychiatrist about who your child is. The psychiatrist needs you. The psychiatrist needs your communication. Let us try uh, to review some types of information that are important to communicate to uh, the psychiatrist to help your child get the best possible uh, treatment. First, uh, describe uh, clearly what your child is doing or not doing. Try not to use general, vague, uh, professional, uh, fancy terms. Uh, for example, don't tell the psychiatrist my child's depressed. What does depression mean? Uh, say instead, uh, my child looks sad, cries frequently, smiles a lot less, does not uh, participate in the fun activities he's used uh, to participating in, uh, has trouble uh, falling asleep, 
has lost five pounds, uh, yells at me when I ask her to do things. Describe in clear, detailed lay language the picture of exactly what's going on. Make sure to give a good behavioral history. Uh, that is, what was your child like before and what exactly has changed? Give a detailed uh, medical history and detailed uh, medication history. Also give a detailed family uh, medical, psychiatric, uh, medication history. Though it initially may not feel comfortable to do this, sharing family history may give the psychiatrist hints of chemical or genetic trends that may be uh, relevant also to your child. Similarly, be honest about your family's uh, social history and what has happened and what is happening in your family. For example, are there stressors uh, within the family that impact on your child? These may include uh, marital conflict, problems experienced by the child's uh, siblings, uh, financial strain, or trauma. Joyful events such as the birth of a new child, a preparation for the marriage of a sibling, may actually be major sources of stress for your child. Uh, generally, the more you communicate, the more likely you are to get better psychiatric care. This communication needs to start with the first psychiatric session and continue throughout the life of psychiatric um, treatment. Let's then uh, uh, restate the original question. Should I give psychotropic uh, medication to my child to improve uh, his or her behavior? I believe the bottom line is as follows. First, rule out uh, medical and environmental uh, causes for the behaviors. Also, try non-medication uh, techniques. Try them well. If the quality of life of your child is still significantly challenged, then consider a psychotropic uh, medication. Uh, when used well under the care of an expert psychopharmacologist, psychotropics can be an important modality in improving the quality of life of your child. The process of finding the, uh, the right medication at the right dose can be frustrating and can be time consuming. But in the long run, these medications along with the non-medication techniques can play a significant a positive role in making your child's life a lot better. Thank you for listening and now uh, for questions. So we have a, a bunch of questions. Let's just, um, uh, once a child is uh, taking medication and it's helpful, is it forever? No. Uh, I think it's really important to continue with the psychiatric care. Uh, it's important not to see the psychiatrist get the medication and not go back for two years. I think that after 
uh, one reaches a good dose of the right medication, you do want to go back to the psychiatrist from time to time and see whether you can slowly uh, reduce medication. Uh, uh, having said that though, a common error uh, do is that they put their kid onto medications and then they quickly want to take their child off. It typically needs a little time. It's very difficult to say how long. Uh, so uh, the bottom line is that one has to be in close touch with the doctor. Um, okay, uh, another question. Uh, before I take my child to a psychopharmacologist, should I take him to a therapist? Uh, usually, yes. Uh, we talked about the fact that behavioral means and other uh, non-medication uh, means can be powerful techniques to improve behavior. Uh, going to a psychologist, a social worker, um, therapist who is expert in, in practical uh, behavioral and other uh, techniques can go a long way to improve behavior and may not make it necessary to go to the psychiatrist uh, for psychotropics. Uh, okay, should I seek a psychiatrist who has specific expertise in, uh, uh, in developmental challenges to treat my child? Uh, the answer is yes, but they may but they may be very hard to find. There are very, very few um, psychiatrists. I think we can probably count them on the fingers of two hands, uh, perhaps, uh, who specifically um, specialize only in developmental um, challenges. So if you can get to those, that would be great. But uh, you might have to uh, make do with going to psychiatrists who have seen many uh, developmentally challenged uh, children, adults, and um, uh, that will usually work if the person has been in the field of, for years and knows the the uh, specific issues that may be uh, different uh, in treating somebody uh, with autism, uh, with intellectual um, disabilities. Um, are there uh, reliable uh, medications for treatment uh, uh, of sleep? Um, I, uh, that's a very difficult question. Um, the truth is that the studies have shown that there are very uh, few medications that reliably work for sleep. Uh, melatonin, which is very popular in, in, in uh, the community. Uh, does not do that well when it's studied uh, uh, scientifically. So there are a lot of people who say that their sleep is better uh, through melatonin, but, but when that is actually tested out, some people do and some people don't. Uh, the effect in the end is probably mild. Uh, trazodone works for some people of uh, Ambien, the benzodiazepines are 
questionable. They work for some people, but they come with a significant uh, side effect um, burden. Okay, uh, how do we find a behavioral um, specialist? Uh, that's a tall question. Uh, there are referral agencies that, uh, that specialize in trying to find um, therapists, um, psychiatrists also, uh, who specialize uh, in particular uh, uh, areas. Uh, 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 relief is one, and uh, there are uh, 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 some others, and you can definitely uh, contact them and then uh, ask them uh, who has a specific uh, expertise in behavioral uh, techniques. Uh, similarly, the uh, next question, how can I find a qualified psychiatrist who specializes uh, in autism? Um, I think going to the referral uh, agencies is probably a best thing to do. Uh, also, some of you probably have friends, um, colleagues, um, case managers, uh, 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 agencies uh, who provide uh, services who can probably uh, refer you to qualified psychiatrists. What happens when we cannot convince the adult child that he, that he needs medication? That is a toughie. Uh, what happens when we, can't, uh, when we can't convince the adult child to clean his room, uh, study for his test? Uh, we have to uh, have a good relationship uh, with our children, uh, communicate uh, well with them. Uh, psychotherapy helps sometimes. Going together uh, to, psych, uh, 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 to psychotherapists and having the child's feelings heard and perhaps uh, working something out with the child is probably the best thing to do. But that is a real challenging um, topic. Um, okay. I have a low-grade depression, self-medicate with alcohol, uh, marijuana sometimes. Are there, uh, are there antidepressants that I could take when I feel that I need them rather than take them on a consistent basis? Uh, no. Uh, antidepressants need to be taken uh, regularly. They need, to, they need to build up uh, blood levels. Uh, there is, at this point, no medication that you can take once, twice, and get rid of depression. It usually takes a few weeks for norepinephrine, uh, serotonin, uh, dopamine changes. So uh, the answer is clearly no. Uh, question is, can you comment on uh, the ADHD medication for non-developmentally delayed children. Um, they have a very crucial place. Um, the, uh, there are many, many scientific studies that show that Ritalin and its many, many cousins uh, have a, a significant effect on improving, uh, on improving uh, focus behavior, perhaps improving uh, academic uh, performance. So if behavioral uh, techniques don't work, they're certainly uh, worth trying. And I think that was our uh, final question, and I want to thank you all. Uh, have a good night.
ったっていう。